Uh, I shall be uh, chairing the next section, which won't be cat herding, I'm sure. Um, the structure that we're going to take, well, first of all, the, the hashtag is, uh, is up on the wall there for people in the room. For people who are not, it's SMW Creative KTN. Um, we've got the speakers' Twitter handles there, so we'll be, we'll be watching uh, Twitter. So do tweet in questions. <laughs> Expecting it to be a really interactive session. The structure is we've got a few presentations to kick us off and kind of stimulate the discussion, and then a Q&A session with the, the panel. A uh, really great set of uh, experience and talking about something that is uh, pretty dear to my heart, uh, which is business models, and particularly how they've been changed and are being changed by social media. A lot of people these days are using the term social business, uh, and over the last literally three or four years now, I've watched how that term is used change quite dramatically from uh, meaning essentially a charitable organisation uh, through to, of late, a, a few people that seem to think that if you set up a Facebook page, that somehow you've got a social business. I think during the course of the discussion today, you'll find out it's something very different than that as we look at really the, the innards of business models and how they've been transformed by social media. And hopefully it'll stimulate some thought for you about what you're doing with your business because there is a real, uh, not only an opportunity to innovate, but a, a real necessity to innovate. I'm going to start off by uh, letting the panel introduce themselves. Uh, start off and get Tom from Audio to, to introduce himself. I'm going to grab a, a mic, Tom, out of the clip. Hi. Sorry. This may hi, how's a lapel? Hi, hi. Uh, my name's Tom Hume. I work at a company called IDEO, which is an innovation consultancy. Um, my background is entrepreneurship, startups. I split my time now between running something called Open IDEO for IDEO, which is an open innovation network, sort of 25,000 people from 175 countries and doing startup stuff, angel investing, and you guys can find any information if you chose to, so that's enough. Uh, is that working? Yeah. Uh, my name is Lisa Rodwell, and uh, I am the Chief Revenue Officer from a company called Moo.com. Uh, we're a fairly young company, we've been around for about five years, so uh, looking at... I'm sure you guys could all hear me anyway. Um, uh, the, the play, social media has very much been a part of our whole evolution and I'm sure we'll talk about that in uh, a few moments. And prior to that I worked in some of the larger um, online companies such as eBay and Yahoo. So again, I have some other points of view from there. Hi, I'm uh, John Mel from IBM. I currently run IBM Social Software Business for Europe um, that have always been doing web stuff at uh, agency software, um, software vendors. Hi, my name is Mel Norman. I have two day jobs. Um, I'm a d digital and social uh, business consultant. And I also am the theme champion for the creative industries for business models and growth. Cool. Thank you very much, panel. Uh, and uh, my background, by the way, just so you know where I'm coming from, is uh, lurking and working with startups uh, since the early 90s, uh, predominantly in Silicon Valley, uh, most recently uh, running two social media based uh, startups. Uh, where we work in the collaboration space, so uh, very much active in that world uh, myself. So I'm going to hand over to, to Tom and then him, uh, talk to you, and we'll grab a few questions at the end of each presentation, and then we'll have a fuller panel discussion. Over to you, cool, sir. thanks. So uh, I thought it'd be fun to kick off with a definition of what a business model is. I'm a bit of a sort of business model geek, I think you'll see that. Um, I'd love to share a definition of a business model and then actually give you an example of a business I really admire. Hopefully just to remind everyone here of all of the intricate parts of business models and then finally just give you a couple of examples of businesses that I think are using social media outside of just marketing in new creative ways. So if we dive into designing business models. So this is a tool we developed was actually helped start an incubator. And we had to look at startups and try and figure out whether their business models were actually good. So let's go through how to visualize a business model, just in four or five minutes. Um, if you wanted any of these assets or anything, just ping me. The easiest thing to do is grab me through my Twitter handle, and I'd be happy to share the framework or anything else. So let's start off. The bit that we all understand, we all see as consumers, is the value proposition. So we always start thinking about any business model, the spine of the business, if you like, by thinking about who we're selling it to, the market segments, and what the value proposition is. 
we always start there because if you don't maximise the value in that, if you don't get that right, everything else is irrelevant. But that's kind of obvious. You have to also think about how you actually deliver that value to the customer. So that's the channel strategy. That's distribution. That's also marketing. So that's how you deliver your value to the end consumer. Now, these are the obvious bits. Traditionally, we as consumers have looked at businesses and we've just sort of thought of them as this. This is all we've seen. But more and more, there's exciting other stuff that actually social media can influence. So one of those, which is a real design opportunity, is the pricing model. Now, more and more, social media is disrupting how we price stuff. It's one of the most interesting places, I think. There's interesting businesses that are structured around pay what you want. You saw first Radiohead's album to do this. There's loads of others. So this is kind of the static business model. Your value proposition, how, who you're selling it to, how you're delivering that value to them in terms of marketing and distribution, and then how you price it. So that's kind of the static business model. But we've all got to create that value. We've got to somehow create the value that the end consumer benefits from. And we do that using our capabilities in-house. So this might be the team, the structure, the process, all of which social media now influence. You just need to look at some of the enterprise solution providers like Salesforce and Chatter. These are all about social media, ways to collaborate in new ways, partnership strategies, Ditto, finding partners and working with them is a really interesting place for social media to explore. This is the static business model. So in other words, your costs are a function of your capabilities and your partners, and you create value, which obviously ends up at the end customer. And the difference between your costs and your pricing model are just your margins. It's whether your business can scale, whether you make money. Now, the interesting thing, and something that I think social media has driven more than anything else, is the world is in flux like never before. Like there's some fascinating stuff around the half-life of an idea. There's a bit.ly blog post that you should look at on this. The idea is that a half-life of an idea is drastically reducing because ideas just go viral when they're interesting immediately. Like an interesting one was the half-life of the, the sort of East, Eastern States um, earthquake not so long ago, six months ago or so. The half-life of that event was four minutes. So all of the mentions of it, half of all of the mentions ever occurred within the first four minutes. So we know the world is in flux, and that means in our business model, if we think for a minute that any of us can stand still in this world, we are dead. The world is changing faster than ever before. So we need to consider our competitive strategy, this stuff, who's going to come in and attack us, who can do the job we do better, and finally, our growth strategy. How do we intend to grow? Businesses are no longer just optimised and then launched and we sit on our laurels. We have to grow. We have to think what our next steps are. Again, social media is an amazing tool for that. So I wanted just to share one example of a business I really admire and you guys will all know really well, which is Amazon. And I like to show this because I think it does a good job of showing how every bit here is a design opportunity. And if we don't think through maximising value from every block here, we end up getting beaten by the competition. So let's talk about Amazon. Like, does anyone know how Jeff Bezos, who I like because he's a pretty geeky dude, how he came up with the idea of Amazon initially? So it's kind of an interesting story. He did something he called a regret minimization framework, where he listed out all of the things that he thought he might like to do in his life, and then thought, which would he regret not doing the most? And the one at the top of his list wasn't an online bookstore. It was a technology retail business. Which is the far, that's the first smart thing he did. He didn't limit himself to a bookstore. We'll talk about that in a bit. But we know Amazon's value proposition. You guys use it. It's smart access to a diverse and deep pool of media. End of. Now, that might be in books. It might be in videos. We're seeing video more and more. But that makes sense. Some of the stuff they're doing, and some of this is influenced heavily by social media, Think about their segmentation strategy. Like, if you go into Common Garden here, there's a Waterstones there. In the past, Waterstones segmentation was people in Covent Garden. They just put the books that they thought the generic person in Covent Garden would want. Amazon take advantage of the internet to hyper-segment. They're people like you. Based on your purchases and your interests, you might be interested in this. So they're using hyper-segmentation. They're leveraging the internet to do something above just being a low-cost bookstore. 
The next thing they do, which we all know, is they, they own the channel, which lowers costs. They understand when to buy brands as a channel, like Javari here in the UK. But their pricing model is fascinating. One of the wonderful things they do is they float pricing. Again, going back to the example, in the past, Waterstones would set the price of a book, and there's no way that they could update those prices nationally very frequently. It's obvious. Just think of the changes required to change all of your assets in that bookshop. Amazon do it instantly. They are continuously split testing pricing to optimize it. The next thing, and this is where we probably don't think about it as much, but it's probably the genius of Bezos, actually, more than anything else, is around the partnership and the capabilities side. So let's start with cost, actually. So cost, like a lot of fast-growing businesses, Amazon's cash flow is far better than their competitors. And the reason is they're starting to move into print on demand, so they don't make anything unless you guys have paid for it. Waterstones have never been able to do that. They've had to make stuff, pay for it, and sling it on the shelves. Next, when they hold our stock, which they do if we're vendors, they charge us to hold it for us. They've turned what was a cost for Waterstones into a revenue model. They've turned costs into profits, revenues. Amazing disruption. And then finally, they understand when to partner and what capabilities they have in-house. A couple of just interesting anecdotes um, that a friend of mine who works there actually, is their CTO, took me through. The first is they have this rule on capabilities that they have a two pizza team. Can anyone think of why they'd have a two pizza team? Go for it. It's exactly it, exactly it. So they say they'll never have a team that they can't feed with two pizzas. Like I worry it's big American pizzas and it's like 400 people. But I imagine it's just a group of 10 people or so. And they empower everyone because they want to be the most customer-centered technology business. Everyone has some sort of line of sight to the customer. This is extraordinary. Like when you launch a product, project in Amazon, you have to write a press release first. It's called reverse innovation. Before you write a line of code, before you do anything, you write a press release. And it forces people to articulate the customer value. So the final couple of things that I think are interesting, just to throw out there, they're happy to disrupt themselves. Competitive strategy, they started selling second-hand books. Can you imagine how hard that is? If you're Waterstones, to say we're going to cannibalize ourselves and sell second-hand books, it's an unbelievably brave decision you only do if you believe in maximizing customer value. And finally, because they said early on they're a technology business, they've gone into cloud computing. They've said 75% of our engineers spend their time optimizing the actual site, the experience, scaling, ordering internal servers. They said, forget it. We're going to build that as a competence, and we're going to sell it to third parties so that actually we can offer better value for our customers ourselves. And it's grown into an amazing business. So apologies, you can tell I'm sort of, I get too excited about this sort of stuff. But you can see business models are an incredible design opportunity. You can also see it shows that there's a farce. If anyone ever tells you Amazon's are really clever because it's a low-cost bookshop, you know it's false. It's the combination of all this stuff. A fun test to understand people's backgrounds and sort of true beliefs is to say, why is Amazon, why is Apple successful? You ask it, if you say, why is Apple successful, you understand what they value. Some people will tell you retail. Some will say service design. Some will say the physical product design. They're all true. It's the interconnectedness that creates the value. And that stuff's really hard to disrupt. So if you look at these building blocks, absolutely every one is a design opportunity. And my hypothesis is although social media is interesting from a marketing perspective, social media is quietly reversing and changing every building block in a business model. So I just wanted to leave you with four examples that I think are less obvious but really interesting spaces. So let's dive into that. The first one, Zinger. Like I'm sure, who's played Farmville, Cityville? You know you have, come on, admit it. It's like, it's okay. It's like a group session. Um, Zinger's a great example. Their innovation process is something called ghetto testing. And what they do is they launch on social media, Facebook, also Google AdWords, which doesn't fall under that bracket necessarily, but also occasionally Twitter. They launch hooks for new game ideas they've got. 
they use it to optimize their innovation pipeline because they see what people are interested in before they've ever written a line of code. So social media can be harnessed to de-risk your innovation pipeline. It can be harnessed to understand what you should be doing next. It can be harnessed to get faster feedback than we've ever had before. Like Zinger equivalents, if you were working in Ubisoft or something, a sort of traditional computer games company, you would have gone out to the world and you would have won focus groups in a really artificial environment and said, would you play this game? The results are bordering on meaningless because it's an artificial environment. Zinger, stick this stuff in front of you in the real environment in which you'll be using it. And social media is the way of unlocking that. So social media is a fantastic tool for making innovation decisions. Right, the next one, has anyone heard of Derwent Capital Partners? So Derwent Capital Partners I think are interesting and I think it's kind of, it's fascinating they're based in London. It's a 25 million pound hedge fund. The only thing they use to make trading decisions is Twitter. And they're aggregating sentiment on Twitter. There's an amazing report you guys could look up. A professor in the States, in Illinois, he actually wrote a paper and he showed that Twitter could predict the closing price of the Dow Jones stock index to 87% accuracy based on sentiment. If you think what in aggregate social media is, it's essentially just a barometer of how we all feel. And how we feel is the best leading indicator of whether we will or won't purchase. If politics and the stock market are aggregates of intent, Twitter is a window into that. So the next one, which you guys probably have heard of, is Twelfth Force. So many of you all know Best Buy. I think social media is fascinating for customer service. So Twelfth Force is Best Buy's approach where they enabled every one of their salespeople to get on Twitter and to answer their customers' questions. It's an amazing way, social media is an amazing way of using a wasting asset. It's a, an amazing way of getting people that were twiddling their thumbs in a Best Buy in Minnesota somewhere to answer a question someone pay, posted in New York. And they do it. You can see from the number of followers that it's sort of 41,000 followers. And it's worth watching. There's also a sort of associated site. So social media is disrupting customer service. And then a couple of others I find really inspiring. This one's more obvious. So I don't know if you guys saw last week, a very legitimate computer game production house in California put up the launch and the development of their new game on Kickstarter. They raised a million dollars in 24 hours. Historically, the funding process they'd have to go to guys in smart offices that would predict if it was going to be a success. Social media is enabling people to fractionate and fund source from many, many more individual places. And again, it de-risks the model. You know this is going to be a success because all these people aren't just saying I'm investing in it. They're not getting shares. They're saying I want to buy it. It totally de-risks the launch of this game. And then final one, which I love. I don't think it's made it to the UK yet, but it's really hot in the US. The growth is amazing. It's a business called TaskRabbit. So TaskRabbit uses social media to distribute jobs. So again, it's this idea of wasting assets. If people are out there and have small increments of time, social media is a way to fill that void. So what you do is you just literally say, I'm willing to pay $5 to have someone pick up my groceries this evening from Waitrose around the corner. And people will actually bid to do that piece of work. So my final one for you guys is, what do you think the most asked for job is on TaskRabbit? Go for it. Genius, exactly. <laughs> Assembling IKEA furniture. So that's a massively interesting use of social media. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tom. I'm going to stay there for a minute whilst uh, John is just uh, getting set up and uh, switching <coughs> over. At least I know what to do with my IKEA furniture now. Um, any questions directly for t Tom? Uh, the entire world, as has happened in certain cases. 
things. Yeah, airlines, great airline examples. So, yeah. I'll probably see the question back, I think, for, for the live stream. So essentially it is really around companies that have a concern about getting employees into social media, letting them speak for the, uh, the company and the risks associated with that. And, and essentially you are um, empowering employees and trusting them um, to go out and do the right thing. And unfortunately, you know, there will always be a percentage who don't do that. So how do you manage to counter that? I think, so I would say in short, I don't think you should try and counter it. Otherwise you end up killing all of the sort of the benefits. So the question is really, do the benefits, do the positives outweigh the negatives? And I think you get some, there's some clear reasons why that is the case. I mean, the first observation is employees of, every employee of every company has always been, to some extent, an ambassador of that business, whether virtually or physically. Now, if we, as larger organisations, don't trust our employees to act as an ambassador, we have the wrong employees. Like, everyone has to act as the face of the company now. It's just total openness and total transparency. So if we think that actually we can protect the outside world from the truth, I just believe because of transparency it will get uncovered. So I would say the benefits, which include faster feedback, giving employees the sense of ownership and empowerment, like an ability actually to learn from the sort of the, gra the grassroots of an organisation, they all far outweigh the few cases where people will be negative. Like, just a little anecdote for you. So I run this website called OpenIDO, 25,000 people solving challenges for social good. We've never taken down a comment because it's been disparaging. Like, we do sit occasionally on Wikipedia, etc. But by an absolute majority, the positives outweigh the few negative comments. So I would always hope that we can design for that last loss of control and just stay optimistic that actually the benefits will be there. Brilliant. Thank you, Tom. I'm going to hand over to John. There will be uh, time for more questions when we do the panel session, so hold on to them, tweet them out, and I'll pass over to, to John. And I think you know, there's a key point there which surprises a lot of the businesses I've worked in, which is your business model determines the type of people you hire. Um, lots of people see it as a very theoretical spreadsheet, but actually it's a cultural thing. Um, your business model oftentimes will determine who it is that you bring into your company and the kind of people that they need to be. I think that's a good, uh, good hand over to John there. Okay, thanks very much. So I said earlier, I, my name's John. I work for, for IBM running our social software business. And take a little bit of approach. I probably would about five, six minutes, or yeah, take a different approach in looking at the business models of actually using social media within your organization, uh, which is something we do a lot of and, and help a lot of, uh, a lot of customers in with. Um, and in terms of what we look at what a social business is, we had that definition earlier, um, we look at organizations that are trying to do three things. They're trying to be engaging with customers, partners, and employees. They're trying to be transparent, as the discussion we just had earlier was saying, and they're trying to be nimble. And when it comes to business outcomes and business models and how you actually integrate that into the DNA of your company, I guess nimble is where we really see a lot of the, uh, a lot of the work going on and a lot of the things that you, you get ROIs out of and can really define a business model around. Um, just some numbers in terms of the level of activity that we have within IBM ourselves in terms of people using social tools, just some of the numbers here. Um, and just in terms of the amount of traffic we save just from going through email by actually getting people to blog, to share files and Dropbox style internally with our internal uh, uh, tools like that, um, are, you know, a huge number of people and a, and a massive amount of use. Um, and often some of them don't even realize they're using social tools as well. Uh, we don't sort of ram it down people's throats and say, you are using Web2, you're using social software. We try and integrate it into the workflows that they currently do and create business models out of that. And this is what we're trying to get rid of. Um, our business model really doesn't support uh, people working like this. Okay, this is the one you get on a Friday, and it says, if you read all these attachments, you'll be up to speed for the new project meeting that you've been assigned to, which is on 9 o'clock on Monday morning. Right? And then you go and get to work over the weekend. So one of the reasons I use social tools internally and try not to email is that uh, I don't like working on weekends. Um, and that's, the you know, that's my business model that I would like to run my life by. But I our business model does not support people being this inefficient at IBM. We, cannot, we, can't, we just can't afford it. It's, it's, that, it's that simple. Um, if you do ever get this email, like this is just something I sometimes do to get a bit of revenge on the guy who, who sent it to me. But, uh, but uh, I've seen this happen before with reply all and reply all and reply all, and it gets absolutely crazy. But as a business model, we can't afford to work like that. 
Um, and it, uh, leadership is very important. So one of the things I did want to highlight is we just had a, a, a new CEO um, for, for the whole of IBM appointed, Ginny Rometty. Um, and one of the things she did was she did not send out the classic all hands email. Okay, she actually posted a video blog in our internal social media site. There wasn't even an email sent out saying, please now go and read the new CEO's uh, blog. It spread virally throughout the organization. And the engagement level we got through that, um, the way it ran through the DNA of the company, the way it said it's OK to use social tools in an organization because the boss does it, was, was pretty spectacular. And it was only a three-minute video done on her first day reflecting on thoughts of her first day in the job. Leadership is very important. Um, but this is just a quick framework. I was going to run through um, an example of each as to how we help organizations and actually we apply to ourselves in terms of uh, understanding why we're using social, what the business models are, and how we drive an outcome-based um, uh, view of what we're doing and drive it within the DNA of our company. Um, aligning to organization goals and culture, uh, gaining social trust, engaging through experiences, networking business processes, uh, designing for reputation and risk management and analytics, analyzing your data, which I think was an interesting point brought out in the last, the last discussion. So very quickly, the really, really important thing is that, got, that you have to align your use of social to your go corporate goals and culture. Okay, you can have the best strategy in the world, but if your corporate culture does not actually, like you see, if you don't trust your employees and you've got an open social strategy, it's not going to work. Okay, so culture be... What's the phrase? Culture eats strategy for lunch. There you go. I had a ruder one in my head. But, um, but so what, what you see, so, so, so our, our, you know, when we look at what our business model is, we, we really need to make our people as efficient as possible because as a large organization, we can have so much red tape, so much bureaucracy. We need to empower people to cut through that and actually get their jobs done. And our culture is very much around that. And so we provide social tools to be able to do it. Now, other organizations have different goals and different aims, smaller organizations, medium-sized organizations. But they all have aims and goals that social can apply to, and you have to align them or it just won't work. Um, one of our customers, BASF, um, they are very keen on making sure that they, have, they, they keep their hierarchy and they keep their team structure and they apply social tools to it. So they're not ripping and replacing. They're not saying we're getting rid of hierarchy, we're getting rid of structure. We're going to keep the business. We're going to apply social tools to our existing business models to make them better. And their goals at the top there is everything that they do in social is being driven by their corporate goals, which you see are those four boxes on the top. Um, gaining social trust is really important. Both, uh, this is an example, cars.com, which is a US company where externally they really try and become advisors on how to buy a car rather than someone who will sell you a car, but also internally as well. Um, the leadership that Ginny showed by posting says it's okay uh, to, to, to spend time uh, working in this way, but also you've got to create an environment where people feel confident. If I do post a comment, am I going to get, am I going to get in trouble? Is people going to take it seriously? So it's important to actually create an environment where people actually gain social trust. And engagement is very important as well. If you think around how we want to make sure that people have access to information all the time, right? You want to make sure that you can interact with your customers at any point that, that, that you can. And this is where mobile, different experiences like gamification to actually drive uh, different experiences through how you work together, how individuals work together, um, is really, really important to maximize the touch points that you get with your audience, whether they're external or internal. And this, to me, is probably one of the key points in terms of uh, networking your business processes. So we're always very keen when we work with customers to define what their business problem is. Okay? Is it because they have a cost uh, in their business that they'd like to turn into a revenue stream? Okay, is it because they, they're, they're, they, they can't innovate products as quickly as they would like to and they want to open up the R&D process to more people in their organization? The best way to get a business model around, and a drive around social tools is to apply it to a problem that already exists and already has a business case and look at how, how can you completely transform it. How can you get your customers involved in the product development process? How can you get your employees, wherever they sit, involved in the product development process? Or in the sales process or in human, or in human resources? Wherever the issue is in your company, how can you improve that? And there was a question around design, you know, uh, reputation and risk management. And this is just as important, in, well, not just as important, but it is, as impor it is important internally um, as well. Um, we often encourage people to actually practice using social tools internally because it's not so bad if they screw up. Okay? Now, there are lots of different ways that you can, uh, you can lose your job at IBM, and uh, being rude on social media platforms, it might just be one of them. Um, but there's nothing different here about just making sure that you follow um, business conduct guidelines that should be followed in, in, any, in any sense. Um, but the key is not that you try and stop 
things from happening or only try and stop things from happening. The key is that you have a plan on how to react when things do go wrong and that you practice that and you rehearse it and you think about it and you engage with people to say, what are we going to do? Um, maybe if, maybe when there is a problem. And finally, analytics. Um, it's really the, the amount of data you create when you work in a social way is immense. And I think this is an area we're investing a lot. I think this is an area in social where we're going to see a huge amount of uh, uh, investment and innovation um, in, the next, uh, in the next couple of years going forward, rather than the, the next greatest way to, uh, to blog or, or, or send a tweet. Um, that amount of data and turning that into insight uh, to close the loop on the business model and drive it back into, into your planning is, is crucial. Um, so that was just a very brief uh, run through. Um, wanted to get that out of the way so we can get to get to questions. But uh, those are my contact details, and that's me on Twitter. Um, please take questions at any time. Thank you. I will take. Uh, thank you very much, John. I will take one question for uh, John right now because I'm sure there are a few burning ones. Like I say, we'll do more questions at the end, but I'll take one now uh, if there's burning ones. Otherwise, cool. We'll press on. Grab a seat. Thanks, John. Um, so I think it's very interesting to see businesses at both ends of the spectrum. You know, we, we talked about small businesses where the business model is completely built around social media, and then at the other end of the spectrum, businesses that have adopted it and used it to change their business model. Um, and Mel's going to talk to us a little bit more about business model frameworks and, and what that means. Um, interesting how social media is revolutionising things. It just turned the, uh, the air conditioning off. So for those people who were freezing at the front, uh, Twitter did that for you. So there you go. <laughs> Okay, now you're going to get really hot at the front, so apologies on that. Okay, um, I'm going to begin my talk. Um, I'm going to try and whiz through it as quickly as possible. This is the title for my talk, so Gnomes, Legos and Other Steps to Building a Social Business Model. So, um, as Benjamin, in, we introduced ourselves earlier, um, I have two day jobs. So, my first job is, is that I help develop and grow companies um, and integrate digital and social strategies into companies' business model, strategy and process. That's one of the roles that I have. Um, the second one, which has got a quite embarrassing title, um, but I'm actually the current uh, theme champion for business models and growth for the Creative Knowledge Transfer Network. Try and say that after a few glasses of wine. Um, so my role for that is really, really exciting because what I get to do is I get to, um, I have a process of doing lots of different activities over this year and I get to help companies figure out and review their business model, do lots of events, give free reports to organisations um, and basically encourage knowledge transfer across the creative industries. Okay, so I wanted to give a little bit of background before I go on to the 10 steps that make a social business. So um, I studied humanities. I don't know if anyone else studied that at college. Put your hand up. Okay. Um, it's quite hard sometimes to get a job after doing humanities course um, because it doesn't really qualify you for very much, um, in my case anyway. So um, I was inspired by Anita Roddick, um, Richard Sempler and other business leaders to learn how to run a business. So I did what any rational 18-year-old would do is I packed up, went to Edinburgh, Indiana um, and learned to run a business selling books door to door. So what did that involve? It basically involved me knocking on doors, um, being rejected, um, dealing with customers and delivering orders for customers, um, avoiding big dogs and doing strange motivational dances outside diners in the morning so that I could do all of the above. So why am I telling you this? Because I wanted to learn how to run a business. This taught me how to run a business, or so I thought. So after this, I packed up all my skills and started working in the film industry. And I thought, brilliant, I have the skills needed now in order to run my film business. It worked okay for a while until we got to the late 90s. And any of you who've worked in that industry know in the late 90s, um, digital cameras were coming into into use um, and the internet was happening and then suddenly all of the knowledge that I had and other producers had suddenly become non-existent and, and, and not really very useful because we needed to change the way we did business. Now most organisations and companies in different industries inherit their business models because they follow other companies and they do something very similar because we think it's safe and we think it's a good way of working, myself included. So. Business needed to be done in a different way, but we didn't have the skills then in the industry to, in order to be able to change that because it wasn't being taught. 
This is the framework um, that uh, Tom showed earlier. And film isn't alone because, as you well know, um, disruptive forces have been happening across digital, social media. There have been many, there will be many more. Um, and it's actually impacted music, TV, film and publishing, which is the latest one to be disrupted. So it crosses all of that. So most companies now are realising that they need to learn how to change this thing. And it's not about reinventing their business totally, but it's actually analysing the way that they do business and know that actually maybe they, they can actually come up with a better way of doing it. Now, just wanted to give a quick example. Um, TV industry. Um, TV industry a couple of years ago, um, they were experimenting with two screen technology. So basically what they found was people were watching TV and they were also playing with their mobile phones, they were on their tablets and on their computers, which meant that you could actually create a back channel for TV. Um, that was great. Now we've been moving on to connected television. So it means the internet and the TV are one. So suddenly that actually transforms and can transform business models. Recently, the BBC, I don't know if anyone um, saw the article, have been experimenting with perceptive media. Has anyone heard of that? But the idea that you have a signal coming into your box, it mixes with the data that exists in your hard drive, I hope I'm not getting too geeky, um, exists with your hard drive, which means you can actually create personal experiences um, on TV. So you can maybe watch yourself in the back of Coronation Street on the wall in a picture. So imagine that can actually transform business models hugely. So, as I said, social media is the, one of the current disruptors. There will be others, and there will be more after that and after that. And that's just an example of TV. Now, there is some good news. Um, there are a group of very, very smart people since the 60s. One of the forefathers of this is a guy called Warren Bennis. And what Warren um, talked about in the 60s about actually helping to develop the business model and actually to help develop the business um, according to organisational development, if anyone's ever heard of that. And actually this quote is just as relevant now today as it was then. Okay, so that's the background. Um, yes, social is just one of the disruptors, but it's important enough that we should be able to look at it and figure out how we can actually develop and change our company. So I'm going to go through really, really quickly um, some steps in order to do that. So here comes the gnomes. So mocked by many, loved by a few people. People who like gnomes are very passionate about what they do. Okay, people who sell gnomes are very, very passionate. And um, this is to represent passion in your business. So in order to actually build a company that's fit for purpose, you need to figure out what your passion is within your organization and set it loose across your vision statement, your mission statement, and literally through the DNA of everything from your brand and your customer services. That's really, really important. Okay. This side stands for collaboration. So collaboration is something we've been talking about in social media for, for quite a while and in digital media and it allows us to do that. But collaboration is beyond co-creation with your clients. Collaboration can happen within your partnerships, your employees um, and also your customers as well. IBM released a report um, a few yeah, well, a few months ago, um, which basically says that a company that's networked internally and externally actually performs, outperforms their peers quite drastically. And what that means is, is you're connected into the, your, your ecosystem. You're sharing ideas and developing things with your partners and your employees. Okay, this represents price and value. So what do your customers find valuable? What would they consider paying for? Now, what that is right now might be very, very different to what they will pay for in six months or a year's time. Um, one of the most profound things I heard a, 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 a year or so ago, which made me think very differently, was it's not what your customers need, it's what job are your customers trying to do with your product or service. If you can actually ask that question rather than about customer needs, you can actually really, really change um, the solutions that you can offer for your customers. So, how can you simplify your business? Lego stands for doing something simple. Um, a Lego piece is a very, very simple idea, but you can actually use it as a building block to build lots and lots of different things. So, many companies I work with have really outdated systems processes. They have like a graveyard in the background of all of these old ways of doing things, which are really sort of not very useful and actually constrain the people who are working within the organisation. Learning. Um, has anyone ever heard the term learning organisation? 
before? Stick your hand up. Okay. So when a person leaves your company, um, they take all their knowledge with them. Not only their personal knowledge, but their knowledge about how to do business better and differently and how maybe the organization should change. That is not generally captured by an organization very well. To create a learning organization, it's about creating, it's about building an organization that's organic and it's about capturing that learning and you know, and literally just thinking, well, how can we do things better as an organization? And then the value for that actually goes back to the employees as well. Questioning. So ask yourself the questions that you're too scared to ask. So how can we maintain our relevance in two years time? Um, will, we, will our customers still buy our product? What else can we do? Ask the questions, but work together with your organization as a group collectively to answer them. Um, and that's really important. I think companies are very scared of this, but they need to learn to, under, to actually ask these questions because it really can help sustain your business in the next few years. Okay, Agile. We all heard, have heard of Agile to do with technology companies and management systems, but being Agile is something that needs to be extended throughout a whole organization. You need to adapt quickly and effectively to change. Innovation. Innovation is not about creating something new, it's about creating something new and using it. So many organizations now are playing with ideas, trying to find out what to do differently. This goes beyond product or service, but it's actually um, the model that um, Tom showed, it goes into every aspect of your business model. This is about integration. Now, most companies have traditional offline ways that they do things, and what they've done is they've actually put social media and digital media as an add-on to that. Um, that's probably not the best way to do things. Um, if you can actually integrate your offline and online strategies and workflows across sales, customer service, etc., cetera, um, you're actually gonna be able to change your business model and be a bit more sustainable. It's the questions. I'll post this on um, SlideShare so you can actually read these in more detail. Um, insight. So um, most companies um, who have social media department, departments actually collect um, data and can do insight very well from that. So what a customer wants, etc. Um, what we don't see as much with SMEs is actually collecting insight through the whole company. If you're going to take a leap of faith and change something you, you're going to be doing, then um, actually collecting the data and having some insight will help you with that leap of faith questions. So finally, um, we've launched a Leap Day Business Challenge um, and Moo have kindly offered us a prize for this. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to encourage companies to review their business model and use the extra day or part of the extra day that you'll have this year in order to do that. Why are we making you do that? Well, we're not making you, but what we want to do is for you to start re thinking and realizing that actually it, it, it's difficult to spend time actually on your business model and thinking about that rather than the day to day but it's really really important um, so if you email this address here on the bottom we will send you a free report um, worksheet um, which will be written by our panel of experts and, and you can actually use that internally to help ask the questions about your business model um, this is me here and we have a business model community for reports, free reports, events, etc. And the code for that is there too. Thank you very much Mel. I'm going to ask the panel to uh, come up and grab their seats at the front so you can see the whites of their eyes as you ask questions. Um, so a range of, of different things uh, here hopefully that you've seen. And it's certainly been my business experience. I think in, in the early days, I didn't think about business models enough. It seemed very theoretical. And I'm still surprised these days how many times I go into a business. You know, one of the first questions I ask is, what's your business model? To really understand what the drivers are and what's happening. And the number of people inside of a business and the number of businesses that actually can't answer that question. They can tell me where the money comes in. They can tell me where the money goes out. Uh, but not that much about actually what happens in between and what the, the levers are on that. So I'm going to open to questions from the floor. So if you raise a hand, we'll try and get a mic to you uh, and uh, throw the questions in one at a time and I'll get the panel to answer. So we've got a question at the front uh, here. If you introduce yourself and just uh, say your name before your question, that would be great as well. Hi, I'm Benita Matoska. I'm the chief sharer and founder of The People Who Share. Um, it sort of strikes me just in terms of some of the examples that you're giving that 
um, lots of examples that are collaborative consumption ventures. How much do you think actually this disruption that we're seeing um, and the, the innovative ways in which social media is impacting and being used is actually down to the rise of collaborative consumption and the sharing economy specifically? Oh, can I start with Unisa's answers to that one? Because I think that's um, <laughs> kind of in your court a bit. Well, yeah, I guess, I guess if, you, if people don't know what Moo.com um, Moo is, is, I'll give a bit of background and, and um, sort of how we came about and sort of how we've evolved. Um, we're an online printing company where you can make personalized you know, business cards, mini cards, postcards. But the beginning... Um, when we started five years ago, we would not have had a business if it weren't for this sort of sharing community because all of our customers um, could only create these cards through the content they were that they were sharing on other networks, whether it was originally Flickr um, in the early days, some of the blogging networks and so forth. Now, over time, that has become, at least for us, less critical for our business, but where the um, sort of the... Uh, the value of sharing still um, is very much part of our business. Um, it's not driving the actual engine of it. It's just in, in you know, how we all share um, uh, recommendations and, and share new businesses and new options and so forth because we, you know, we are a small organization. And so those networks where in the early days you had to use to create the cards are now actually a more communication vehicle. I'm not sure that answered it exactly, but from our perspective. Yeah. So I, I think that if you look at some of the stuff like John Hagel writes, where he talks about how economies or, or organizations are changing where they used to be valued for what they had, right? So they'd get an asset, they'd make money out of it, and they'd sell it on, whereas now they're valued by what they, by the flows, right? So how, what, what, how assets flow between organizations is what actually drives value. And then you look at how that affects individuals, and we see a big change, certainly on our side, that you used to be valued for what you know as an individual. But now the culture is changing, so you actually become valued for what you share. And that, is a, that, that transition is actually quite difficult um, to drive and to get people to understand that. Um, and I think that is sometimes where the generational divide comes in, not that younger people get technology and older people don't, but, but more in terms of what, what you are valued for and why an organization values you as an employee, as a customer, whatever it is. But I think there's, there's certainly a shift um, in, 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 in how that, that is perceived, and then you need the technology that actually allows you to, uh, to drive that. So, you know, Facebook and f social file sharing is a much easier way to do that than email and, uh, and, and traditional ways of, of communicating, both internally and externally. Uh, just quickly to add, I think with a lot of organisations, the way that the, their industry is changing, it means that they don't necessarily have all the skills in-house to actually do the required job. So I think that partnerships are really, really good and collaboration through that actually then cr you know, makes up for having a bit of a skills gap in a lot of organisations. So, so collaborative consumption is, I think, absolutely on the rise for a couple of reasons. So it's worth reading a lady called Rachel Botsman's book who pretty much pioneered the term. The first thing is, I think there's sociologically, there's a big shift away from ownership and it's from fundamental reasons. Like, and in fact, an interesting indication of that is if we just look around London at the number of storage companies, it is a sure sign that we've all got enough shit. We've kind of got enough ownership. And if you look at the recession recently, the financial climate, it's reminding us that actually sometimes sharing can be better than full ownership. What I think is interesting is social media lowers the cost of sharing so that we can do it efficiently. So Whipcar in London, amazing example of that. It's kind of a better collaborative consumption example than Zipcar, which everyone's like. Airbnb or London's equivalent, um, One Fine Stay. All these businesses are actually being enabled because social media makes it more efficient. And I think the bit around efficiency people don't talk about enough is social media gives us a proxy for trust. So in the past, it would have been a random, you get a letter, some random dude's going to come and pick up your car and drive it for a day. You'd absolutely freak out. Now you get notification that this person that you can do a bit of research on online through social medias is going to borrow your car and actually feel more comfortable. So social media is making it more efficient, but secondly, it's becoming a proxy for trust so that we can actually trust people that we don't have that close personal tie with. 
Nobody's driving my car. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, it, interestingly, that, that question, it's worth asking at each of the, the points in the business model. So you know, one is what we talked about there, the new product opportunities. People are buying products that they didn't buy before that are um, you know, more co collaborative created. There's opportunities in different sales models because things are coming to market in a different way, being introduced to customers in a different way. Internally in the business process, you heard about there are different ways of running that business process, which for us it creates a product opportunity. I run a business where we do an online collaboration tool in the B2B environment. That tool doesn't work in old cultures. It works in very flat, very collaborative cultures. So there's, there's change in that. Right the way back through to partnerships and what you do in the back end in the way that you can work more collaboratively with partners in, in you know, effectively in real time and sustaining those relationships with social media, all the way back to kind of sourcing and product costs. So it actually touches on each one, creating new markets, new ways to get to them, new ways of doing that, and new business models for that. So, yes, quite exciting. Next question. I, I think uh, Fyan has it over in the corner there. Strategic mic placement. We've got some questions at the end of the rows. So. <laughs> Hi, um, Farhan here. Um, one of the questions I have for you guys, the business processes that you're talking about, who would you say would be the best people to be making those decisions within the businesses? Because especially in the larger organizations, you know, you'll have marketers looking at social media and kind of looking at social impact to their business, but they're not necessarily going to be in a position to be able to drive this conversation in the same way that a CEO or a VP would be able to. So who would you say is the key owner of that or is responsible for that and should be driving that? Well, I, I think that's a really tricky question and I'm not sure I have the answer, but um, I will comment on it. I think obviously the smaller organization that you have, the easier it is uh, to just happen naturally, especially if it's a very young organization where you have a lot of even younger people who are, it's just, they're just natives, it's all part of what they do. Um, but even in our organization that's relatively small, I've seen um, both it coming from the top, um, uh, because there's a real sort of, everybody embraces it themselves, but also from various organizations. So our customer service team, while it's not necessarily their, uh, it wasn't their responsibility, the, so, the whole, um, especially social media outreach and so forth, we, they started to use it on their own in communicating with customers without even, you know, there being a, a formal process. Now, I think that's more difficult moving into a big structured company, but when you talk about, uh, or when you looked at the example with um, Best Buy, um, I mean, that obviously was put in place in a really structured way, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was um, piloted in a particular store or a particular region or something. So it's not the answer, but I, but I think that if, if, um, if you do have a collaborative nature anyway within the organization, um, using it first internally uh, may make it, as you said, I think, uh, easier to, to do externally afterwards. Yeah, I think who, who does make the decision isn't necessarily who should. Right? I mean, that, that's kind of what, what happens. But I wouldn't underestimate the ability of you know, what you might call tradition, like department heads, line of business heads, to actually becoming more and more empowered and actually making decisions about these things, especially with the ease of provisioning. Um, you know, they don't need IT anymore. Um, so what we see a lot of times is people getting very impatient for their internal IT to actually roll something out, and it's an 18-month rollout, um, uh, where actually they, you know, they can go and they can provision it online in hours or seconds in, in cases. I think the challenge then becomes is one department goes and does one thing, another department does the other, the other department does the other, and then two years down the line, once the CEO gets it and say, wow, we definitely need to get on top of this social thing, but oh my God, I've got all these different things doing different, uh, and, and, and how do I now tie that in together, and how do I take advantage in, of what's going on in part, to part A of my organization and benefit part, part B? Um, that's where it starts to get, starts to get tricky. So just best by example, I really, one of the things I admire about that is the CEO actually made a sort of audacious goal and said in three months, we will have this in place. And when you make a public statement that, like that, it becomes a sort of social contract. It becomes a lot harder for other people not to stick to. I feel pretty strongly it should start from the top. And so from the top, it's about two things. One is about giving permission. And secondly, being careful around things like job descriptions. Too often we see, job descriptions and balanced scorecards that are too specific about how a job 
gets done rather than the outcome desired. And if we were all tasked to come up with specific <coughs> outcomes, then we would have permission and freedom to use social more. So it might be a place to look. I mean, um, Atos Origin just said, to, well, not just, it was a while ago, they said they announced they were going to be e internal email free in, in two years. Oh, nice. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> and I was a CEO from the top, and then you're right, it became a social contract, and it's like, well, how are we going to do this? Wow. Awesome. I agree with Tom, it should be from the top, but what I've seen um, more often than not is someone at the top decides that this is the way things should be done and then tells everybody that's the way things should be done. And what you get then is you get ownership at the top, but you don't get it throughout the whole organization. So the people that have the knowledge are the people that exist in all the different ranks and the different hierarchies within your organization. So if you can get um, a team or a group of them involved, what you can find then is you can find that the decisions that happen at the top, then you can actually see practically how it will actually change, whether it will work. And when I've seen that happen, even with organizations like UNESCO, who are traditionally very structured, is you can actually, you can actually <coughs> see the change much quickly, more quickly. <laughs> and I, it's interesting, because they're, they're kind of challenges with both layers. I think the challenge is, if you get a leader from the top going, yeah, let's do this, let's adopt social, they don't necessarily see the things that people who have specific ownership for parts of the business model will, will see opportunities that see you won't. So it's a combination of permission and, and people on the ground. However, I think the interesting thing is, a lot, lot, most, if not all, business mistakes result not from um, the wrong answer to the question, but from the wrong question. And in a way, the whose responsibility is it, in some ways, is the wrong question. Um, you know, whose responsibility is it in the organisation to respond to change in the culture in which we sell into? You know, everyone looks around and it's like, oh, you know, somebody's going to appoint a chief culture officer and I have to hurt myself. Um, but you know, fundamentally, there are some things which become everybody's responsibility. It's just, what, you know, what's my piece of doing that? As, a, as a, a CEO or a leader, it's giving people permission to do it. As somebody on the ground, it's putting forward the ideas where you've seen, through asking the questions, the opportunities to change the, the business model. There was another question over here. Um, it's been answered, sorry. Wow, there we go. Um, question from the gentleman in the brown beige jacket. Uh, hi, yeah. Uh, to what extent are you looking at like a pre-industrial <coughs> education system providing departmentalized management systems, which we're now in like a post-industrial era, and you're trying to apply these business models to companies that through an, have come from an education system, coming from a briefing system, coming from an employment system, coming from an HR system, and a whole system is devised to stop what you want to initiate. So actually the problem could be the people and the whole system. But you're at the top trying to persuade everyone to do this. How do you get through that? <laughs> Is the factory broken? Who wants to start with that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a go. So clearly there are legacy companies. Companies go through phases, I think. One is around <coughs> exploration of new ideas and the other is around exploitation. So. If we look 100 years ago at Henry Ford, he spent some time exploring what the Model T Ford should look like. And the rest of the time, it was about exploitation of that idea. Build a hierarchy, make it ultra efficient, use tools like Six Sigma to actually limit variance, etc. The problem is, when the world is changing so fast, you can no longer work serially. You have to work in parallel, so explore ideas and exploit them in parallel. Companies generally, I think, are designed to do what they're doing incredibly efficiently. The problem is they pick up momentum. And this is why I think we see such fast growing startups because they're structured differently. Like, you know, you read the letter from Zuckerberg about the hacker way. This is a more network based business where ideas can come from the ground up. The challenge is for those companies, the big companies with big momentum that are all about inefficient, sorry, efficiency and don't want to see any variance, and then it's got to come from the top down. Like, there's a great article called The Ambidextrous Organization, which kind of talks to this. It's why it has to come from the CEO. If you're going to get the company to change, you can't expect everyone to do both things at once. You have to kind of farm out those two exploration and exploitation functions. Does that make sense? So, I mean, the UK, so, 
CEOs running those companies really aren't really focused on innovation like you guys are. So I'm wondering how you are applying that so to think, get people to change. So yeah, there's, so I guess there's a couple of things in there. First is actually the big companies are doing what they can and sometimes that's around acquiring new cultures. It's about looking at small companies that are growing fast and actually kind of learning from them. Other times it's about these separate autonomous businesses like incubators if you like and there's some good examples of that. Where I agree with you is probably the thing that lags this, your mindset more than anything else, is actually our education system. So the idea that we can all specialise, like I did physics, the idea that actually just doing physics would be useful in this new world is kind of ridiculous. So I'm looking forward to seeing education systems catch up with what you're saying because that will really accelerate it through business. Exactly. <laughs> Um, just to add to that, I think um, with a lot of organisations, if, if they, if they realise that they need to change, they try and change everything all at once um, and, and that can cause lots and lots of problems. So I think with some, with some companies actually starting quite simple and actually, as, as John was saying, um, putting an internal system into an organisation and testing ideas and testing things out. If you imagine the habits that you have as an individual, we have good and bad habits. If you imagine um, then very large companies and everybody has habits and behaviours about the way they do things, it takes a while to change those habits. It's a process. It's not a necessarily a destination. It's a continual process. And as John said earlier about um, culture eats strategy, you can have strategy to your heart's content and desire, but if people um, can't actually, the culture doesn't support that, then you're not really going to get a lot of things happening. So I would say it's a process, a, a, a subtle process, but bit by bit. And just maybe a, maybe a contrarian point, but I think sometimes there's an idea that it's not binary, right? It's not that either we have organizations which just follow processes and don't let anyone vary anything that they're doing, or we have a complete free-for-all and, and, and a social utopia where anyone can do anything. Like, for example, do I want to have variance in air traffic control systems? Maybe not. I don't, I don't, I don't know, right? Maybe, maybe I'll be proved wrong. I don't know. Tweet or, if you see a plane. Yeah, tweet, yeah. Or, or do you want it in the manufacture of medical equipment? Do you want variance there? Probably not, right? Do you want variance in how you deal with customers where you have to follow a strict process? And you have to do, yes, of course you want variance there. So I think sometimes the pendulum it goes swings kind of can come too far. Either way, the actual pragmatic solution is somewhere, is somewhere in the middle. Um, but uh, but that, that to me, I think sometimes we, we forget that maybe we, you know, some of the old ways did work, but maybe we need to change a lot of them uh, in order to get to that, that middle balance. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think that's the interesting thing is this, this, there, there is always that balance in business between the kind of innovation function and, and the business as usual. And actually we need to do both layers and particularly at this point, there is probably more required in terms of, you know, the, the innovating. But there's something I think historically about change that um, you know, my collection of weird degrees I did theology and have this concept of now but not yet we see the change very immediately but for that change to cascade through is dramatically slow sometimes so I, you know, I started doing um, online stuff in, in sort of 92, 93 and we're talking about the death of the high street you know, last time I went out to the weekend it was looking a bit sick but it was still there and um, so these processes take a long while to, to wash through that said yeah, now is the time that businesses should be looking at and asking the hard questions. And I think that is, as you say, actually more broadly at a society level as well. Um, you know, so what, what is it that we need to change? But you know, I think in terms of staying sane and, and what was it, regret, regret reduction framework, mm -hmm. we have to kind of look at the bits that we can touch and, and do what we can with those pieces. But also I think if you look at, well, you mentioned manufacturing, and I think it was in, in the, the case of the uh, Boeing or BMW or both of them, but the innovation they made was actually becoming project managers of the, of the manufacturing process rather than becoming manufacturers and be, being manufacturers in their own right. So they didn't reduce variance, they still want the cars that come off the assembly line and the planes that come out to, to be the same. But the, where their innovation came from was actually what we're going to do is we're going to transform how these are designed and transform how these are assembled. And we're at, our expertise is going to be in the project management of that rather than actually in the manufacturer of that. So they, there was innovation in that business model, but it didn't necessarily change the fact that they, they, they want consistency in their output. Yeah. And I think what is, what is changing is, 
is a step change in the speed and scale of communication. And that's really what's going off. We started a model of conversations. We built uh, organizational structures to deal with the fact that there's a very limited scale to a conversation and how information can propagate. And now technology has come along and kind of broken all of those rules in terms of how many people can contribute to a conversation, how many time zones they can, can be across. So anything that is structured around the rate of communication, that's going to get changed, that's going to get disrupted. And that started to happen in some places. There's a lot more places where it will happen. However, that isn't everything, although it is an awful lot of business that's impacted by that. One more question from the floor. Brian over here in the, in the corner. Everyone's gone into that thinking mode. I can see kind of people. Thank you. Um, my name is Brian Condon. I'm one of the co-founders of the Centre for Creative Collaboration. Um, I'm not quite sure how to put this, but. <laughs> But, but it's kind of made me think. I object to this term collaborative consumption. We're not about that anymore. Uh, and also I'm worried too, because I think what we're seeing is value capture going on. And I'm not sure that it's going in the right direction as far as most of us are concerned. So while I hear the optimism in the room, I also can see the bucket of cold water, which says look at the value in the Facebook IPO look at where the value of that is going in terms of monetary value, and also look at the behaviours of larger companies who buy smaller companies not to innovate but to kill. And actually all the stats show that most large companies that buy smaller companies, they do it not to innovate, they do it so that they can stop disruptive innovation. So I think what we're seeing, we haven't started to see it yet, but we are seeing some of the snapbacks that will be likely in the way in which the financial structures are behaving when we look at how value capture is going on. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I, don't, I haven't got a fully formed argument here, but I'd be interested in your views on that, that we're likely to see the social value that we're generating from the interactions that we all believe in and talk about perverted by the drive to, in inverted commas, monetize. And that's why this term collaborative consumption disturbs me. Anyone want to respond? <laughs> I, will, I will make a point. And I think there's, there's two things. I think me personally, and people who know me will know that I kind of always look at you know, what the flip side is. Because certainly in putting social media inside of organisations, it's not completely a party. And I think th those of us who have been involved know that. You go through pain points because you change culture, because there are issues about changing accountability, uh, disempowering some people who held power through, through being the gatekeepers of communication. And um, so it is always good to look at the other side. I think the interesting observation in your question is the places where that value capture is happening in unusual places, and where I mean unusual, I mean in places where we wouldn't want to sit. So all these people made Facebook happen, but yet all the value ended up in a very small circle. It's interesting that those things, as a pattern, happen where the new, the new system, for want of a better word, the new way of doing things, touches the old one. And that consistently there is that pattern. And that isn't new. If you go back yeah. and look historically, at, you know, as you have it, things like the Industrial Revolution, that happens where, we, where there is a, a very dramatic change in things. You know, the, you know, the, the new kind of comes, but isn't there completely. So I think we will see more of that. Um, in the last few weeks, we, we were having discussions around what happens with, with personal data. There have been some interesting things about that that have been discussed recently where, again, these are business model questions, actually. You know, if you're going to use people's personal data to be part of your sales process, what are you giving the customer back for that? Are you making that explicit? Uh, and we're also talking about rights and, and photography, which is another interesting area where you've got an old pre-existing business model, and many business models, in fact, and a new, very different way of doing things coming in. And where the two butt against each other, it is, it, you know, it is pretty ugly. I don't think that stops um, uh, very innovative things coming out. But I think, as a general rule, you know, look at where the new touches the old. In most of the businesses I've worked in, the killer is legacy. Uh, and you know, it's what stops innovation. It's what stops markets changing. It's the legacy that's there. Legacy doesn't go away uh, overnight in large organisations is there for a very long while, and legacy exists in markets as well. And it has a surprising long tail to it. You know, people who bought TV sets, those will last them for a period of time. Um, that gates what people are going to do and how they're going to consume content because they've made that investment. 
And whilst we, you know, for, for those of us who spend a lot of our time in the social media world, we're used to things changing on a daily, hourly, minute by minute, you know, four and a half minute uh, half-life, the reality of the, the kind of outer limits of systems is much, much slower. Um, some of the business models that I'm working with at the moment, the limitation is how long it takes stuff to get from China to the UK. That hasn't changed a lot uh, in the last decade, although it may change now. So yeah, there is this balance and change isn't smooth, and I think it is wise to look at you know, what's the downside to what we're doing. Just so. To, so on your specific, I think I share, there's one word that worries me, and that's the consumption word in collaborative consumption. The th and I don't necessarily think it's a mistake because actually the easiest place for us to see collaboration get traction is actually in consumption because it's clear that it's more efficient. The system's more efficient, so it's got traction. I think it's going to unlock a new set of behaviours that enables us to see collaborative creation. And that's the really exciting bit. And for all of these sort of spaces where you can say, look at Facebook and say all the money's migrated there, I think if you think of Facebook in terms of a series of interesting relationships that will create new value in the future, I'm comfortable with value flowing to Facebook. I think the exciting thing is how instead of just, you know, if you look at the sort of the trend of 3D printing, the idea that we will all be able to collaborate and make everything customised for all of us is kind of where the dream is. And that will be true online, but in the same way as it's true of atoms, it will be true of bits. And so I'm excited that actually if you compare the choice, I think this is the point you were making, I'm actually happier with collaborative consumption than generic consumption or something, and I'm more excited about collaborative creation, which has to be the next wave. So if you believe in access, if you believe in transparency, then actually being able to work with Kickstarter, with Facebook, has to be better than the alternatives, which were it was the privilege of the few. I think this, this is not a fully formed, uh, fully formed <laughs> for idea in a beneficial nation, but I think there is something around the fact that when value is captured, and the kind of value that we're talking, it, it's not a, in a social world, it's not actually a zero-sum game, exactly. right? So when we often, when we're looking internally and people say, well, why should I share stuff? I've got plenty of things to do. Why should I bother sharing things? We actually start to look at selfish behaviors for people to share. Okay, so the reason I might bookmark an interesting site is not so I can share it with my colleagues, it's so I can find it again, because I've got 200 of the damn things, and how, if I use tagging, I can actually find it, right? So like a delicious model, but, but internally. So then what you start to get is you start to get interesting side effects. So what happens is, by actually doing something that's actually of value to me, maybe we call that consumption, I'm actually creating value um, at the same time which I think is different in social than it was, say, in industrial, mm -hmm. in industrial where, where there was a, a thick sum of resources that could only be spent in certain ways. Once you start doing collaboration, once you start putting collaboration in it, you start to get interesting second-order effects. So it's not, as, it's not a, a, as you said, a, a zero-sum game. Oh, excellent. But a good, uh, good thought-provoking question. Yeah, and I think... Good. My observation, as, as somebody who's kind of come from a, a very sciencey, very engineering background and kind of moved more into the creative space, is that a lot of businesses optimised out creativity. And what we're seeing now is a swing back towards valuing creativity and collaboration and the things that go with that. Um, it, it's not a smooth journey, but I think it's a good and interesting one um, and one to be embraced. Um, just on, on that note, um, I would say, I mean, my background, I'm, I'm not an MBA graduate. I'm, I'm somebody who's, who's learnt by doing and learnt as a consultant. Um, but one of the biggest assets, I think, in an organisation and in business you have is actually creativity. Um, and I know a lot of creative companies and think, well, I can't do that business stuff or, you know, that sounds like too much. Actually, the biggest asset you already have, and it's just about applying that to, to frameworks and systems that already exist. Cool. I, um, I think one other observation that kind of goes in that question and something I really struggle with is that businesses are very good at valuing things that show up on the balance sheet. Uh, and so in terms of revenue and cost, businesses are very good at understanding that. And particularly when you talk about um, you know, social media and using that internally, using it externally, because it's very difficult to say, oh, well, that's going to be a 20% increase in sales, it becomes very difficult to get people to embrace that and work with it. I think the interesting thing at stepping back and looking at things at the business model level is it moves that question beyond the immediate cash balance sheet and starts to help people see 
how does this improve my partnerships? How does it improve my route to market? How does it improve my product development cycle? And it helps people to rationally think about the other impacts of, of social media in the business, both within and without, that don't turn into this, does this give me 15% you know, more revenue by next Wednesday? Um, uh, and with that, I'll, I'd like to hand over, because there's some, you know, some, some great ideas. I'd like to thank the panel very, very much for their, their time and answers. <laughs> and I'd like to thank you as well. It's some uh, great stuff that I'm going to digest on the, the Twitter stream. I'm watching my mobile phone vibrate its way across the, the floor over there. Thank you for the questions. Um, I think many of the panel will be around for a little bit, so there will be opportunity to ask questions. But there are also some practical things that you can do, and we'd like you to do. So I'm going to get uh, Anita to talk about that just for a minute before we escape for a very nice drink. Hello, all. I'm Anita from Creative Industries Noise Transfer Network. It's so lovely to see such a full house and really, really pleased to have everybody here today. I'm just going to um, just give a quick introduction to the KTN. Some of you might know of us already, and some of you may never have heard of us, but we are um, one of 14 um, noise transfer networks that are funded by the Technology Rashti Board, which is a government innovation agency. And um, we, are, um, we are here to support businesses within the creative industries by being able to try and signpost um, where funding calls can be available for collaborative R&D. Um, we also try to create a platform to, um, for networking to be able to help businesses find partners um, through our events, um, also um, through our online website as well. And also we try to share knowledge um, around themes and technologies within the creative industries. So um, inside your pack, you will find a little tiny leaflet here. Um, it has our website on the top. Do go on and um, read a bit more about us. Um, also, we're a membership organisation. It's free to join, so if you'd like to become a member, it takes but a few moments, just follow the steps um, one by one. Um, we'd love to have you join. Um, and also, um, hopefully, we will see you at some other events um, in the future as well. You may also have an opportunity to become maybe a member in the spotlight where you're able to um, have an opportunity to promote your platform and your narrative as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So there are drinks. Don't stop asking hard questions. Keep asking hard questions uh, and being creative and innovative. <laughs>